Stop. You haven't paid your 15 souls. I don't have to pay. Why not? I'm a light horseman of the king's household. And you? I don't have to pay either, but I'm a musketeer. The play doesn't begin till two o'clock and the floor is empty. Let's have a little fencing practice. Psst, flanking. Yes, champagne. Look, I have cards and dice. Let's play. Good idea, my friend. I've stolen a little light from my master. It's nice of you to come before the lights are lit. Touché. A club. A kiss. They'll see us. No danger of that. When you come early, you can you can eat in comfort. Let's sit here, my son. Three aces. A drunk should drink his burgundy in the house of Burgundy. It's as if we were in some den of evil. Drinkers, brawlers, gamblers. A kiss. Good heavens, to think that Rotru was performed in such a place as this, my son. And Corneille. Tra la 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 la. You have yourselves, boys, no pranks. Oh, sir, how can you even suspect such a thing? Do you have your string? Yes, and my fish hook. Good, we'll fish for wigs when we're up there. Come closer, my young rascals, and let me educate you, since you're about to try your hand at stealing for the first time. Hey, have you brought your pea shooters? Yes, and peas, too. What's the name of the play? La Clarisse. Who wrote it? Masu Balthasar Borrow. It's a play that... And lace, especially on the legs. Cut it off. I was up there at the first performance of the Cid. Watches. You'll see some very famous actors. Handkerchiefs. Montfleury, for example. Light the chandeliers. Belle rose la pile à Beaupré Jodelet. Ah, here's the refreshment girl. Oranges, meal, raspberry syrup, cider. Out of the way, you brutes. Are there marquee down here on the floor? Not for long. What's this? We've arrived like tradesmen without disturbing people, without stepping on their feet. What a shameful way to make an entrance. Kouiji Brise. Ah, the faithful are here. Yes, it's true. We've come before the candles. No, don't talk about it. I'm so annoyed. Cheer up, Marquis. Here comes the lighter. Ah! Linier, still sober. <laughs> Shall I introduce you? Baron de Nouvet. Nouvet. Ah! He has a charming face. Really? Masoud, Masoud de Cuigy de Brissé. Delighted to meet you, gentlemen. He's rather handsome, but he's not dressed in the latest fashion. Monsieur de Nouviette has just arrived from Touraine. Yes, I've been in Paris only three weeks. I'm entering the guards tomorrow at a, as a cadet. There's Madame Aubry, the magistrate's wife. Oranges, milk, la la. People are arriving. Yes, in droves. All the fashionable societies here. Madame de Guimeni, de Bois Dauphin. Whom we have loved. De Chauvigny, who plays with our hearts. I see Monsieur de Cornet has come from Rouen. Rouen is the academy here. I see several members. There's Boudou and Boissard and Corot de la Chambre. Porcher, Porcher Colombie, Bourzet, Boudon, Aubard. All those names that would never die. It's awesome to see such men. Look, our lady intellectuals are taking their places. Barthenois, Noide, Omenador, Casadans, Felix Zerri. Dear God, but their surnames are exquisite. Marquis, do you know them all? I know them all, Marquis. My friend, I came, to, came with you to help you, but since the lady isn't here, I'll return to my vice. 
No, stay. You know everyone at court and in the city. You'll be able to tell me the name of the lady for whom I'm dying of love. Ready, gentlemen. Macaron, lemonade. I'm afraid she may be coquettish and refined. I, I don't dare to speak to her because I have no wit. I don't know how to use the elegant language that's in style nowadays. I'm only a soldier, a shy soldier. She always sits in that box there on the right. It's still empty. I'm going. Oh, no, stay. I can't. The Susie is waiting for me at the tavern. A man could die of thirst here. Orange aid? Bah. Milk? You're trying to make me sick. White wine? Aha, I'll stay a little longer since you insist. Now about that white wine. Ah, oh, Ragano. There's Ragano, the great baker. Sir, have you seen Monsieur de Cyrano? This is Ragano, the pastry cook of actors and poets. You honor me too highly. Not at all, you're a patron of the arts. Poets do come to my shop to buy on credit, and you yourself are a talented poet. So I've been told. You're madly in love with poetry. It's true that for an ode, you give a tart. Only a little one if it's a short ode. No need to apologize. Such modesty. And what do you give for a triolet? Rolls. Rolls of the very highest quality. You love the theater, too, don't you? I adore it. You pay for your theater tickets with pastry. Tell me, just between ourselves, how much did you pay this time? Four custard tarts and fifteen cream puffs. Monsieur de Ciro isn't here. I'm surprised. Why? Montfleury is in the play. Yes, that walking barrel will play the part of Phaedo today. But what does it matter to Cyrano? Haven't you heard? He took a dislike to Montfleury and ordered him not to appear on the stage for a month. Well, what of it? Montfleury is in the play. There's nothing he can do about it. Ah, that's what I've come to see. Who is this Cyrano? He's a man who knows how to handle a rapier. A nobleman? Noble enough. He's a cadet in the guards. But his friend Le Bret can tell you, Le Bret, you're looking for Bergerac? Yes, and I'm worried. He's an extraordinary man, isn't he? The most delightful man under the sun. A poet, a swordsman, a scientist, a musician. And what an uncommon appearance. Yes, I doubt that the solemn Philippe de Champagne will ever paint him for us. But odd, impetuous, brash, and outlandish and he, as he is, proudest of all the thin-skinned swaggerers lovingly spawned by Gascony. I think he would have given the late Jacques Hello, a wild swashback buckler, to place among his portraits. With his triple-plumed hat, his billowing doublet, and his cape majestically held out behind him by a sword that rises like the insolent tail of a cock. He carries his nose above a punchinello ruff, a nose that... Ah, gentlemen, what a nose. Those who see it pass by can't help explaining, exclaiming, no, it can't be true. Then they smile and say, he'll soon take it off. But Monsieur de Beaujolais never takes it off. He keeps it on and ruins, runs his sword through anyone who looks at it too closely. His blade is half the shears of fate. He won't come. He will. I'll bet you a chicken a la Ragonneau. <laughs> I'll take that bet. <laughs> Gentlemen, she's terrifyingly lovely. Skin like a peach, smiling with strawberry lips. And so fresh and cool that anyone coming near her might catch a cold in his heart. There she is. Oh, so she's the one. Yes, quickly, tell me who she is, I'm afraid. Magdalene Robin, known as Roxanne. Sharp-witted and intellectual. Alas. Free... An orphan, a cousin of Cyrano, whom we were just discussing. Who is that man? That, my friend, is Count de Gu Guiche. He's in love with her, but he's married to Cardinal Richelieu's niece. He wants to arrange a marriage between Roxanne and Viscount de Valver, a sad specimen of a man whom he can count on to be obliging. She's opposed to it, but de Guiche is powerful. He can persecute an untitled girl like a her. Incidentally, I've written a song exposing his crafty scheme. He must hate me for it. The ending is positively vicious. Listen, I'll sing it for you. No, I'm, I'm leaving now. Where are you going? I'm going to pay a visit to Viscount de Valver. 
Don't do anything rash. There's a good chance he'd kill you. Stay. You're being watched. It's true. I'm the one who's leaving. I'm thirsty and I have an appointment. I'm in a, in a, in a tavern. No sign of Cyrano. It doesn't seem possible. I'm hoping he hasn't seen the poster. Begin the play. Begin. Degwish has his own little court. Another Gascon. Yes, but a flexible, calculating Gascon. The kind who succeeds. We'd be we'd better go and pay our respects to him. Take my word for it. What beautiful ribbons, Monsieur de Guiche. What would you call that color? Is it Kiss Me My Darling or is it Doe's Belly? I call it Six Spaniard. An appropriate name because soon, thanks to your valor, the Spaniards in Flanders will be in a very sickly condition. I'm going to sit on the stage. Are you coming with me? Come, Volver. Volver. I'll throw my glove in his face this instant. What? Oh, no. I was reaching for a glove. You found a hand instead. Let me go and I'll tell you a secret. What is it? Lanier, who just left you. Yes, go on. He's about to meet his death. He wrote a song that offended a certain very powerful person, and tonight a hundred men. I know because I, I'm to join them soon. Have been posted. A hundred? By whom? Sorry, I can't tell you that. Oh, come, come. It's a professional secret. Where are the men posted? At the Port de Nez, on his way. Warn him. But how can I find him? Hurry to all's favorite taverns, the Golden Wine Press, the Pine Cone, the Breaking Belt, the Two Torches, the Three Funnels, and leave a note for him in each of them. Yes, I'll go. Oh, the vile cowards. A hundred men against one. How can I bear to leave her and him? But I must save Lignier. Begin the play. My wig. He's bald. Good work, Paige. <laughs> you young bandit. <laughs> Why this sudden silence? Yes, it was just told to me by someone who knows for certain. Shh. Is it true? No. Yes. In the grilled box. The cardinal. The cardinal? The cardinal. That means the end of all our fun. Put out that candle. A chair. Silence. Will Montfleury soon be on the stage? He'll be the first to appear. Cyrano isn't here. I've lost my bet. So much the better. Montfleury, bravo, Montfleury. Happy is he who shuns the pomp of courts and solitary exile self-imposed, and who, when gentle breezes. Haven't I ordered you off the stage for a month, you wretched scoundrel? Oh, what? Who? He's here. Cyrano. Off the stage this instant, king of the king of buffoons. Oh, but you refuse? Shh, enough. Come on, Montfleury, don't be afraid. Happy is he who shuns the pomp of... Well, prince of louts, must I give your shoulders a taste of wood? Happy is he who... Off the stage. Oh, happy is he who shuns... I'm about to lose my temper. Protect me, gentlemen. Go on with your acting. If you do, you fat oaf, I'll tan your cheeks. Enough. I advise you all to sit quietly in your seats, otherwise my cane will rumple your ribbons. This is too much, Montfleury. Montfleury will leave if he doesn't want his ears clipped and his belly slit open. But he will leave. You can't. You, are you there? Still there? Very well, then. I'll go up on the stage and carve that thick sausage into thin slices. In insulting me, sir, you insult the dramatic muse. You are a stranger to that muse, sir, but if ever... If, you, if she ever had the honor of meeting you, the sight of your hat, stupid face, would inspire her to give you a vigorous kick in the broadest part of your anatomy. Montfleury, Montfleury, borrows play. Please have pity on my sword. If you don't stop shouting, you'll frighten it out of its scabbard. Make room, step back off the stage. Is there something you want to say to me? Speak up. Monsieur de Cyrano is arrogant today. His tyranny must go. We've come to see the play. The play, the play. If I hear any more of that song, I'll break every head in this theater. You're not Samson. I can do as well as he, sir, if you'll be so kind as to lend me your jawbone. This is incredible. Scandalous. Exasperating. Hilarious. Montfleury. Cyrano. Silence. Woof, woof, cock-a-doodle, dude. Quiet. Or 
help meow i order you to be silent and i issue a collective challenge come i'll write down your name step forward young heroes you'll all have a turn i'll give each of you a number now who wants to be at the top of the list you sir no you no uh, I'll dispatch the duelist with all the honors that are his due. All of you who want to die, hold up your hands. Does modesty forbid you to look at my naked sword? No names? No hands? Then I'll get on with my business. I want to see the theater cured of this boil. Otherwise, I'll lance it. Aye. I'm going to clap my hands three times. By the third clap, you will be gone. Ah! One. Aye. Stay. He'll stay. He'll go. Gentlemen, I believe two. I'm sure it would be better. Three. Boo. Boo. Coward. Come back. Let him come back if he dares. He's the spokesman of the troop. Ah, here's Belarose. No, Belarose. No, no. Jodelet. Miserable clods. Ah, ah, bravo. Very good. Bravo. No, bravos. Our beloved bulky tragedian has had a sudden. He's a coward. He had to leave. Tell him back. No. Yes. Tell me, sir, what reason do you have to hate Montfleury? I have two reasons, my fellow young friend, either of which would be sufficient. The first is that he's a deplorable actor who brays like an ass and wrestles ponderously with lines that ought to soar lightly from his lips. The second is my secret. But you are high-handedly depriving us of La Clarisse, I insist. Sir, your pig-headedness can't change the fact that old Borrow's verse is worthless. I feel no remorse at having deprived you of trash. Oh, a Borrow. My dear, it's... How dare he? Such insolence. Fair ladies, blossom and be radiant. Fill our dreams with longing. Soften death with a smile. Inspire poetry. But don't judge it. What about the money that will have to be refunded? Now there's the first sensible thing that you've s s yet been said. Far be it from me to impose hardship on practitioners of the thespian state. Thespian art. You take this purse and be quiet. Ah! Oh! At this price, sir, I'll be glad to have you come and stop our performance every day. Boo! Boo! Even if we must all be booed together. Please clear the hall. Everyone out, please. This is madness. What a scandal! Montfleury, the great actor, don't you know he's protected by the Duke of de Candal? Do you have a patron? No. You don't have a... No. What? You have no great lord whose name protects... For the third time, no, must I say it a fourth? I don't rely on some remote patron for protection. My protector is always near at hand. Are you going to leave the city? That depends. But the Duke de Candel has a long arm. Not as long as mine, when I give it this extension. But surely you wouldn't dare. I would. But go now. But go, or tell me why you're looking at my nose. I... You find it surprising? You mista you're mistaken, my lord. Is it limp and dangling like an elephant's trunk? I didn't. Or hooked like an owl's beak? I. Do you see a wart at the end of it? I. Or a fly walking on it? What's unusual about it? Nothing. I. Is it a startling sight? Sir, I've been careful not to look at it. Would you please tell me why? I was. Does it disgust you? Sir, does its color seem unhealthy to you? Sir, is its shape obscene? Not at all. Then why that disdainful expression? Do you find it perhaps a little too large? Oh, no, it's quite small, very small. Diminutive. What? How dare you accuse me of anything so ridiculous? A small nose. My nose. You've gone too far. Please, sir, I... My nose is enormous. You snub-nosed, flat-faced wretch. I carry it with pride because a big nose is a sign of affability, kindness, courtesy, wit, generosity, and courage. I have all those qualities, but you can never hope to have any of them, since the ignoble face my hand is about to meet above your collar has no more glory, nobility, poetry, quaintness, vivacity, or grandeur. No more nose, in short, than the face that my boot is about to meet below your waist. Help! Guards! Let that be a lesson to anyone else who may feel that the middle of my face is amusing. If the Joker is a nobleman, I deal with him a little differently. Administer his punishment from the front and higher up, and not with leather, but with steel. He's beginning to be annoying. He likes to bluster. Isn't anyone going to silence him? Yes, I will. Just watch his face when he hears what I have to say to him. You have a nose that... Your nose is, um, very big. Yes, very. Ha! Is that all? Well, I'm afraid your speech was a little short, young man. 
You could have said, oh, all sorts of things, varying your tone to fit your words. Let me give you a few examples in an aggressive tone. If I had a nose like that, I'd have it amputated. Friendly, the end of it must get wet when you drink from a cup. Why don't you use a tankard? Descriptive, it's a rock, a peak, a cape, no more than a cape, a peninsula. Curious, what do you use that long container for? Do you keep your, pe your pens and scissors in it? Gracious, what a kind man you are. You love birds so much that you have given them a perch to roost on. Truculent. When you light your pipe and the smoke comes out your nose, the neighbors must think a chimney has caught fire. Solicitous. Be careful when you walk with all that weight on your head. You could easily lose your balance and fall. Thoughtful. You ought to put an awning over it to keep its color from fading in the sun. Pedantic. Sir, only the animal that Aristophanes calls the Hippocampa elephanta camelos could have had so much flesh and bone below its forehead. Flippant, that trust, that tusk must be convenient to hang your hat on. Grandiloquent, no wind but the mighty arctic blast majestic nose could ever give you a cold from one end to the other. Dramatic, when it bleeds, it must be like the Red Sea. Admiring, what a sign up for a perfume shop. Lyrical. Is that a conch, or are you a triton risen from the sea? Naive. Is that monument open to the public? Respectful. One look at your face, sir, is enough to tell me that you are indeed a man of substance. Rustic. That don't look like a no, no nose to me. It's either a big cucumber or a little watermelon. Military. The enemy is charging. Aim your cannon. Practical. A nose like that has one advantage. It keeps your feet dry in the rain. Or finally, parodying the grief-stricken Pyramus in that of Theophile de Vau's play, this nose destroyed the harmony of its good master's features. See how the traitor blushes now for shame. There. Now you have an inkling of what you might have said to me if you were witty and a man of letters. Unfortunately, you are totally witless and a man of very few letters. Only the four that spell the word fool. But even if you had the intelligence to invent remarks like those I've given you as examples, you would not have been able to entertain me with them. You would have spoken no more than half the first syllable of the first word, because such jesting is a privilege that I grant only to myself. Come, never mind. Such arrogance from an uncouth barbarian who, who isn't even wearing gloves, who appears in public without ribbons or tassels or braid. I have a different idea of elegance. I don't dress like a fop, it's true, but my moral grooming is impeccable. I never appear in public with a soiled conscience, a tarnished to honor, threadbare scruples, or an insult that I haven't washed away. I'm always immaculately clean, adorned with independence and frankness. I may not cut a stylish figure, but I hold my soul erect. I wear my deeds as ribbons, my wit is sharper than the finest mustache, and when I walk among men, I make truths ring like spurs. You! I have no gloves. It doesn't trouble me. I had a pair not long ago, but I lost one of them, so I threw the other one away in someone's face. Stupid, loud, insolent, poor, ridic ridiculous ass. Delighted to meet you. I'm Savinian de Cyrano de Bergerac. <laughs> Buffoon! Oh, what's he saying now? I must move it. It's fallen asleep. It needs exercise. What's the matter? I have a cramp in my sword. So be it. I'll give you a charming little thrust. Poet! Yes, sir, I am a poet, as I'll demonstrate by composing an impromptu ballad while I fence with you. A ballad? You don't know what that is. Allow me to explain. But the ballad consists of three eight-line stanzas. Oh, with a four-line refrain at the end. You. I'm going to compose one as I fight with you, and when I come to the last line, I'll draw blood. No. No, wait and see. Ballad of the duel between Monsieur de Bergerac and an imbecile in the Hotel de Bourgogne. What's all that? It's the title. Make room, this will be worth seeing. Step back, quiet. <sighs> Wait, I'm thinking of how to begin. There, I have it. I take off my hat and discard it. I slowly abandon my cloak. I draw my sword out of its scabbard, preparing to put it to use. For the moment, I stand here before you, elegant, calm, and serene. But I warn you, my impudent scoundrel, when I end the refrain, I draw blood. You should have avoided this battle. Now, where shall I skewer you, goose? In the side, neath the sleeve of your doublet? In the heart, neath the ribbon you wear? No, I have carefully thought and reflected and finally made up my mind. The paunch, that's where I've decided, when I end the refrain to draw blood. I see you give ground when I press you. Your face is as white as a sheet. Has coward a name that would suit you? 
and dexterously parry the point that you hoped to thrust into my entrails. Your efforts are doomed to be vain. Prepare yourself now to be punctured. When I end the refrain, I draw blood. Refrain. Pray God to forgive your transgressions. The close of our combat draws near. A coupe, then a feint, then the... When I end the refrain, I draw blood. Ah, magnificent, charming, phenomenal, unheard of, foolhardy. Congratulations, my compliments. Bravo. He's a hero. Allow me to shake your hand, sir. It was a superb exploit, and I begin believe I can claim to be a judge of such things. It, it made me stamp my feet with joy. What is that gentleman's name? D'Artagnan. I'd like to have a talk with you. Wait till this crowd thins out a little. May I stay? Of course, sir. Montfleury is being booed. Sick transit. Sweep out the theater and lock the door, but leave the candles burning. We'll come back after dinner to rehearse the new farce we're going to present tomorrow. Aren't you going to dine, sir? No. Why not? Because, because I have no money. What? That bag of money? Alas, my month's allotment lived only for a day. And for the rest of the month, I have nothing left. What foolishness to throw it all away. Yes, but what a gesture. Ahem. Sir, I, I can't bear to think of you going hungry. I have plenty of food here. Take whatever you like. My dear child, my Gascon pride forbids me to accept the slightest morsel from your fingers, but since I fear refusal would offend you, I will accept. Oh, very little. One of these grapes. Only one. This glass of water. And half a macaroon. But that's ridiculous. Oh, please take something else. I will, your lovely hand. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. You wanted to have a little talk, a talk with me. I'm ready to listen. My dinner, my drink, my dessert, they are ready to begin. I have an excellent appetite this evening. What was it you wanted to tell me? That you're going to have some badly distorted ideas if you listen only to those fools who like to give themselves such warlike airs. Talk with a few sensible people and you'll be better informed of the effect produced by your act of bravado. It was enormous. The cardinal. The cardinal was there. Yes, and he must have found it. Highly original, I'm sure, but he is an author himself. He could have been displeased to see another author's play disrupted. You've made too many enemies. About how many would you say I've made today? Forty-eight, without counting the women. Really, that many? Yes, first there's Montfleury, then the burger you kicked, de Guiche, Valvert, of course, Barreau, the Academy. Stop, that's already enough to delight me. I don't understand the way you live. Where will it lead you? What are you trying to accomplish? I was once confused and bewildered by all the complicated courses of action that were open to me. Finally, I chose. What did you choose? The simplest course of all. I decided to be admirable in everything. If you say so. Well, let me ask you something else. What's the real reason for your hatred of Montfleury? You can tell me the truth. That bloated old sot with a belly so big he can't touch his own navel still considers himself a terror with the ladies and gives them amorous looks with those frog-like eyes of his while he's bumbling his lines on the stage. I've hated him since the day when I first saw him look at... It was like watching a slimy slug crawling on a flower. What's this? Do I understand you rightly? Is it possible that that, that I'm in love? Yes, it's true. May I ask with whom? You've never told me. With whom I'm in love? <laughs> Come now, think a moment. This nose of mine, which precedes me by a quarter of an hour wherever I go, forbids me ever to dream of being loved by even an ugly woman. You ask me whom I love. The answer should be clear to you. Whom else would I love but the most beautiful woman in the world? The most beautiful? Of course. The most beautiful of all women. The most captivating, most intelligent, the blondest. For God's sake, tell me, who is she? She's a mortal danger without meaning to be one. She's exquisite without giving it a thought. She's a trap set by nature, a rose in which love lies in ambush. Anyone who sees, who has seen her smile, has known perfection. She creates grace without movement and makes all divinity fit into her slightest gesture. And neither Venus in her shell nor Diana striding in the great blossoming forest can compare to her when she goes through the streets of Paris in her sedan chair. Now I believe I know it is becoming clear. It's perfectly transparent. Your cousin Magdalene Robin? Yes. Roxanne. Then you ought to be overjoyed. You love her. Tell her so. You've covered yourself with glory in her eyes today. Oh, look at me and tell me what hope this protuberance might leave me. I have no illusions. Sometimes in the blue shadows of evening I give way to tender feelings. 
I go into a garden, smelling the fragrance of spring with my poor monstrous nose, and watch a man and a woman strolling together in the moonlight. I think how much I, too, would like to be walking arm in arm with a woman under the moon. I let myself be carried away. I forget myself. <laughs> and then I suddenly see the shadow of my profile on the garden wall. My friend. My friend, I have bad moments now and then, feeling myself so ugly all alone. Do you weep? Oh, no, never. No, it would be grotesque if a tear ran down this nose, as long as it's in my power to prevent it. I'll never let the divine beauty of tears be sullied by such gross ugliness. There's nothing more sublime than tears, and I wouldn't want a single one of them to become an object of ridicule, be ridicule because of me. Come, don't be sad. Love is only a game of chance. No. I love Cleopatra. Do I look like Caesar? I adore Berenice. By the appearance of a Titus... But you're overlooking your courage, your wit. Take that girl who offered to give you dinner just now, for example. You could see for yourself that she was far from detesting you. Yes, it's true. Well, then, you see? And Roxanne herself was pale as she watched your duel. Pale? You've already made a deep impression on her heart and her mind. Don't be timid. Speak to her. Tell her so that, so that she'll laugh in my face. No, that's the one thing in the world that I fear. Sir, this lady would like to speak to you. My God, her duenna. My lady wishes me to ask her valiant cousin where she can see him in private. See me? Yes, she has things to tell you. Things to, to tell you. My God. So she will go to early mass at the St. Roche Church tomorrow morning. Ah, oh my God. When she leaves the church, where can she go to talk with you? Where? I, my God, where? Well, I'm trying to think. Tell me. At, at Ragano's shop, Ragano, the, the pastry cook. Where is it? It's it's on, oh, oh my God, it's on the, the Rue saint Honoré. Very well, seven o'clock. I'll be there. Me. She wants to see me. I see your sadness has vanished. Ah, for whatever reason, she knows I exist. Please be calm. No, I'm going to be frenzied and turbulent. I need a whole army to vanquish. I have ten hearts, twenty arms. It's no longer enough for me to cut down dwarfs. I need giants. Quiet. We're rehearsing. And we're left leaving. Cyrano, what is it? We brought a friend, much the worse for wine. Linier, what's happened to you? He wants to see you. He can't go home. Why not? This note warns me. A hundred men against me because of the song. Great danger. Port de Nes On my way home, will you let me? Let me sleep under your right roof tonight. A hundred men, you say. You'll sleep at home tonight. But... Take that lantern and walk. I'll cover you, and you follow at a distance. You'll be witnesses. But a hundred men. I need at least that many this evening. But why should you risk your life? Le Bray is grumbling again. For this drunkard? Because this drunkard, this walking wine cask, once did something admirable when he saw the woman he loved taking holy water as she was leaving church after mass. He hurried to the front, and even though he ordinarily can't bear even the sight of water, drank it all. It was a lovely thing to do. Yes, wasn't it? But why should there be a hundred men against one poor poet? Let's go. Gentlemen, when you see me charge, don't come to my assistance, no matter how great the danger. I want to go and watch. Come along. Are you coming, Cassandra? Yes. Come, all of you. The doctor, Isabel, Leander, everyone. You'll form a gay, charming troupe that will add a note of Italian farce to the Spanish drama, and you'll surround its solemnity with the merry sound of your ch chatter, like jingling bells around a tambourine. Bravo. Quick, a cloak. Where's my hood? We're off. You, gentlemen, will inspire us with your music as we march. Bravo, officers, ladies in costume, and twenty paces in front. We'll walk alone, under the plume that glory herself has placed on my head, tw with twice the pride of Scipio, and a nose three times as long. Remember now, no one is allowed to lift a finger to help me. Already? One, two, three. Doorkeeper, open the door. Ah, Paris lies before us, dim and nebulous in the shadows, with moonlight flowing down the slopes of her roofs, an exquisite setting for the scene about to be performed. There, beneath the mist, the scene quivers like a, a mysterious magic mirror. You will see what you will see. To the Porte de Nesle. To the Porte de Nesle. You asked Mademoiselle why a hundred men had been sent to attack one poet. I'll tell you. 
because that poet is known to be a friend of mine. 